we yes, now sir. move on to the second lecture i invite dr pratima shinoy ma'am professor and head vspm dental college nagpur to introduce our next speaker dr meena ma'am thank you over to you ma'am thank you thank you so much uh, very good afternoon to all of all the esteemed faculty who are here today so nice to see you all uh, at the outset i must first congratulate uh, kritika for a wonderful lecture and kritika my heartiest congratulations to you you know i am your big fan and i'll always be so because the way you have progressed is really amazing i have seen you just out of pg and now you here you are reaching to european heights so my heartiest congratulations to thank you thank you so much ma'am thank you yeah and uh, before i begin uh, i would like to thank uh, dr rajkumar dr mahalakshmi and their team for a wonderful program and giving me an opportunity to chair a session of one of my very dear friends dr meena and it's really an honor i feel i was just uh, interacting to her two days back and i didn't know that i'll be chairing her session but thank you madam for that opportunity and uh, without wasting much time i would like to just give a, a, a small introduction of dr meena so she was the former head professor and head of the department of vs dental college and right now she is a phd guide in rajiv gandhi university of health sciences she holds a masters in fellowships in micro endodontics from savita dental college and she has many publications national as well as international and has uh, credited with uh, chapters in books and also as a reviewer of books apart from this i have a very special thing to say about her that she is the only person who sits through all the lectures in all the conferences and it's really heartening to see her thirst for knowledge and even if you've gone out and come back you can always pick up from her whatever you have missed so that is one thing about uh, meena which i think i all of us should pick up so i invite dr meena for the lecture and thank you uh, the team srm for giving me this opportunity thank you over to dr meena meena you can start thank you thanks a lot dr pratima for such a wonderful introduction okay i never knew you would be my uh, chairperson and i am very honored <laughs> and i am very happy to okay yeah. Thank you. yeah thank you i would also like to thank dr mahalakshmi dr rajkumar and the team srm for having given me this opportunity to say few words in front of you today i love a big good afternoon one and all my former colleagues colleagues senior faculty so i'll proceed with my uh, presentation before i begin my presentation i would like to tell you this is going to be a one on one on post ti indirect restrictions many of you may want six so from how to teach in groups or how to do pedagogy and how to be an e guru a gamut of how to you know go about teaching now let us go into how are we going to manage the skill learning with knowing few basic things so the topic for today is post ia indirect restrictions instead of making it a review i thought let it be a decision making process where you know what about all these situationals and how you will decide about what sort of restriction to give you as you all know indirect restrictions help in a have a versatile role in reconstruction mm -hmm. of posterior teeth you can have the correct anatomical form required for that patient unlike a direct restriction where you just uh, do by sight and also it allows for a well contoured restriction with a emergence profile excellent polish or surface finish and of course the indirect restrictions help in the structural support of a tooth so when we come to decision making we often look at the tooth look at the radiograph and just think okay let me do a direct or a semi direct or indirect 
which may not be the correct method. One has to make the diagnosis only after removal of carious lesion. At that point of time, you will know how much of anatomic, functional and aesthetic need of the tooth is there in a much more concentrated or focused way. You will also know about the quality of the remaining heart tissue and the thickness of the remaining walls. You also should consider the position in the dental arch because as the tooth is more distal, it is subject to more forces, potential conditions. For example, you have to look at the wear facets and also if there are any parafunctional habits. And in case it's a deep cavity, protection of pulp and dental complex becomes important too. Overall, after you give the restoration, there should be no caries and periodontal disease recurrence in that tooth. So considering all these things, the decision making should be made only after removal of caries tissue or failing restoration, not just by looking at the tooth and the radiograph. Let us move on to the next part. Let us know about the biomechanics and how we plan indirect restoration based on the biomechanics of the tooth. As you all know, the strength of the intact tooth depends on the interaxial dentin. Interaxial dentin is also referred to as the occlusal isthmus. Then we have the pulp chamber roof below that, the marginal ridges at the proximal side, and also the intact cusps, the buccal and the lingual cusps, or buccal and the lingual axial walls. This, uh, the picture on the left gives you a clear idea about how the center of the tooth is and how it is in relationship with the buccal and the lingual walls, also known as the axial structure and the proximal marginal ridges. The picture on the right shows you how the pulp chamber extends as the interaxial dentin and you see the cusps on the buccal and the lingual aspect and the marginal ridges on the proximal aspect. So coming to summing it up, the central structures are the interaxial dentin and the pulp chamber roof. Interaxial dentin is the cervical occlusal continuation of the pulp chamber roof and occupies that space in the coronal uh, part of the tooth structure. And this interaxial, uh, the interaxial dentin connects the axial walls the buccal and the lingual walls. And when interaxial dentin is in, intact, that is the central core is intact, loss of any peripheral structures, marginal ridge may not produce so much of a structural weakening of the tooth. However, when the marginal ridge is lost and also some part of the interaxial dentin is lost, then there is more of a compromise. Similarly, when the pulp chamber roof is lost and when both the marginal ridges are intact, it may not have much significance as compared to loss of both marginal uh, structures, including the pulp chamber roof, like for an endodontically treated tooth, where the strength of the tooth drops down to 63% when both the marginal ridges are lost. So now coming to the hierarchy, now you have to know what is the hierarchy or the importance of biomechanics or which order it should be? One, the top place would be taken by the central core of the tooth, known as the interaxial dentin, followed by the marginal ridges at the proximal surface, then the roof of the pulp chamber. For example, if it's a straight cut with only the roof with a minimal uh, invasive type of axis, the strength that is lost is only 5%. So if it's clubbed with one or two marginal ridges. The fracture strength loss is much more. And we lastly have the enamel dentin complex of the intact tooth, which is a very significant clinical factor, whether to cusp the tooth or not, whether it should be an inlay or a non-lay. So this brings about the decision making, whether it should be an inlay or a non-lay, depending upon the thickness of the remaining enamel dentin complex or the thickness of the remaining area of the enamel dentin complex or the cuspal thickness at the base. 
Let us move on to different types of cavity that's possible for indirect restoration. Inlay is an intracoronal restoration without coverage of cusps. Onlay is a restoration with coverage of one or more cusps. And overlay covers the entire occlusal surface of a tooth. But mind you, unlike the conventional crown, has specific supragingival peripheral limit. And then we have the veneer lay. Uh, veneer lay is an overlay combined with a buccal veneer. And also we have additional overlay. Additional overlay is something which you add on to the tooth. So generally, there is no tooth preparation. And occlusal uh, veneer or tabletop, it is a thin 1 to 1.2 millimeter bonded posterior occlusal uh, partial coverage restoration and has a non-retentive design. There are four types of uh, overlay. This classification was taken from a foreign article of a different language in 2017. Tabletop is a thin 1.5 millimeter, approximately 1.5 millimeter thick overlay, which is bonded onto an amble. The type two is little more thicker and bonded onto the dentin. And we have the type three, which has a reconstituted core. That means it has a buildup and the type four, which is used for endodontically treated teeth. We also have the endocrown for uh, posia indirect restoration. It's a one piece core and crown and depends on the friction of the pulp chamber and addition with the available tooth structure it has its own typical indications. Now coming to indications. Okay, now we know with this background, when we look at a clinical situation, we should know what are the typical indications for indirect restoration. Let us stick to the basic of small to medium size cavities with supragingival margin for composite restorations. However, now the indications have extend, extended or expanded with uh, advancement in materials and techniques. It need not be always supragingival. It can also be slightly subgingival intraclavicular margin or it can be in a very uh, uh, ideal occlusion, probably uh, uh, cover of uh, cusp, etc. But for all practical purposes, one can be very sure about doing a very good direct restoration with small to medium sized cavities with supragingival margins. Then when do we do the semi-direct restoration? When the cavity is moderate to large size cavity, where you know the occlusal uh, a width is more, or it may have unusual contact areas, maybe it's a rotated tooth, or more than the average contact distance, and the patient requires it quite urgently, and it has to be cost effective. Maybe we can look at semi-direct type of restorations. And indirect, definitely, when there is loss of one or more multiple cusps, when the margin is subchangeable, and when the proximal box with open lateral walls, et cetera, are typical indications for indirect restorations. So let us look a little into the semi-direct before we move on to indirect restorations. Semi-direct restorations can be fabricated intraorally and then transferred extraorally for additional polymerization. What we require here is, these are a series of pictures of how a semi-direct restoration can be made. After removal of failed restoration caries, et cetera, and we decide it has to be a semi-direct restoration, we can take an alginate impression and pour a fast setting silicone dye. It takes about four minutes for that dye to set. And then we can layer the composite on that. And then because it's a flexible dye, you can look at the uh, proximal margins, that uh, gingival KO surface margins, see that it has uh, been, uh, you know, it's optimum. And then it can be finished and polished and cemented into the cavity. Of course, the impression material and the dye material has to be different. It can also be polyether and uh, stone dye, or it can be a condensation silicone type of impression with an additional silicone dye, but it, it can never be the same material, both for impression and the dye. Then, 
Now we have CAD CAM technique, which can be used for doing semi direct restoration, where some of the all the process can be transmitted to the lab online in real time, or it can be made in the dental office if they have a CAD CAM equipment. Coming to the two broad categories of indirect restoration, traditionally we have been having conventional restoration, which used to have a frictional fit with the marginal walls and mechanical retention like dovetail, the grooves, etc. And now what we have is the adhesive restorations, which are bonded partial restoration. Then let us move on to the decision making criteria for. Cuspal coverage. When do we do cuspal coverage? Rather, this will tell us how much of cuspal coverage needs to be done for different situations. When the structural deficiencies are there only in the occlusal 2 millimeter of then you require only a shoeing, not the full-fledged cusp covering. And when there is loss of up to the middle third, then you can have a cusp coverage either above the equator line or below the equator requires cuspal cover by capping up to the cervical line. There are two schools of thought. One school of thought believe that all endronically treated tooth, because when the marginal ridge is lost, the cusp behave like cantilever needs to be cat. And the other school of thought say, need not be if sufficient uh, thickness of um, tooth structure is available at the base of the cusp. So maybe you will have to see according to the situation, condition of the patient and take a call. Then coming to typical indication, we just thought, okay, any cavity, for a direct restoration should be small, sub, uh, supra gingival. For, uh, uh, for an indirect restoration, there should be crack or it should be wide. What actually is wide? So coming to how we make the clinical choice, cavities that exceed the dimension of one third to one half the distance between the peaks of the cusp, that means cavity is very wide. Then when there is destruction of at least one cusp, or an undermined uh, buccal or lingual cusp, and then absence of marginal ridge, especially when there is additional compromise of interaxial dentine or the occlusal isthmus or the central core of the tooth, and difficult to restore points of contact. I have already given examples. For example, when the distance is more, when the contact is very wide, when the occlusal load of the patient is more, it may be a rotated tooth. Any difficulty in restoring points of contact. And then let us look into the contraindications. Patients with high caries risk is a definite no-no for indirect restoration. Patients with periodontal disease, poor levels of oral hygiene, severe degree of erosion, excessive loss of tooth tissue, which may be inadequate for bonding, and patients with parafunctional habits. So with this, we cover the indications, contraindications, the biomechanics of the tooth, when you may decide what you would like to uh, take up, which kind of restoration. Now, moving on to materials that are used for indirect restoration. The conventional materials were always metals. They included traditional high gold alloys. And when the cost of the gold became very high, there were other low cost options such as low gold alloys, palladium silver alloys, base metal alloys, etc. But to this day, the traditional high gold alloy is the gold standard for the indirect restoration, of course, with the drawback of color, cost, and modern attitudes to appearance. Even I would like to have a tooth color sort of restoration and maybe put up with all its uh, you know, complexities. There is more preference for tooth colored materials. Let us look into the tooth colored materials now. Feldspathic porcelain was more suitable only for anterior restoration because of its limitations with its properties. And in the 1950s, we had the metal ceramic or porcelain bonded to metal. However, the opacity of the metal was seen through and it was not truly mimicking the natural tooth. But now 
with the continuous development of ceramic materials with improved mechanical properties and new processing methods it has resulted in an aesthetic revolution. We have a gamut of materials. Resin composites came into existence after the porcelain bonded to metal. Now we have many more systems available. The indirect resin composite uh, systems are available and offers a range of materials that can be used for post indirect restrictions. Of course, we have the CAD CAM material, the zirconia, the glass ceramics, and the resin infiltrated ceramics. So we have, you know, then more slowly we are moving towards a uh, resin free type of material. So we are, you know, a lot of uh, studies is coming up on 3D printed additive polyether ether ketone manufactured via fused deposition modeling. Of course, it has to become more uh, focused and uh, more uh, work has to be done on this. But maybe we'll move away from metal free and also monomer free. Let us see what the future will take with respect to the materials. Then coming to material consideration and how much of tooth structure has to be removed for any monolithic type of restoration, one to tooth colored restoration, I would like to tell for any monolithic tooth colored restoration, about one to 1.5 millimeter of tooth structure has to be, uh, it has to be accommodated. Coming to the workflow for indirect restorations, of course, first is the diagnosis, the caries risk assessment, the pulpal status, the functional activity, that means the occlusion, the load which is there, are all the teeth uh, present, or is there any unfavorable occlusion loading, et cetera, the periodontal condition. Then coming to the typical indications, again, I would like to repeat a wide cavity, a deep proximal lesion with subgingival margin, a failing direct restoration, rehabilitation requiring recreation of occlusal surface, because in an indirect situation, if required, you can mount it onto an articulator and have a proper occlusion suitable for that patient and root filled teeth with crack lines and heavy occlusion loading, having parafunctional habits, etc. In class two cavities, vital teeth and endrontically treated teeth, where the occlusal isthmus or the cavity is wide, more than half, this is for the benefit of all of us. We should always remember there will be a wedging force acting laterally and the remaining buccal and lingual walls might be compromised or high stress concentration and then leading to catastrophic fracture sometimes in endodontically treated teeth extending to the subgingival level where the res restorability of the tooth might be in question. Cuspal coverage in such type of situation will preserve the integrity of the tooth. So when you have a wide cavity and all the situations I mentioned earlier and the thickness of the cusp at the base is borderline and it's an endrontically treated tooth, maybe you will consider the option of cuspal coverage to preserve the integrity of the tooth for a long period of time. Now let us look into the principles related to each and every type of material. For a traditional metal indirect restoration, your tooth preparation should have certain guidelines. Of course, the metal indirect restoration do not follow the morphostructural and histoanatomical course of the tooth count. It definitely requires a mortise-shaped box form. The taper of the cavity walls should be two to five degree for frictional fit, because frictional fit is also an important mode of retention form for indirect metal restoration and presence of shoulder, occlusal sort, and all the line angles should be rounded. For ceramic restoration, based on the inherent fragility of the material, three primary requirements are, one, you have to avoid internal stress concentration. There should be adequate thickness of ceramic and the insertion axis should be very pa passive. Coming to the new morphology-driven preparation. So this is the mantra for morphology-driven preparation. Always try to reduce dentin exposure, 
have a, a guide for tissue reduction. That means if you want to do a occlusal surface reduction, you have depth cut burst, or you can have a silicon index, you can have punch and drill type of control. So you serve, uh, preserve so much of the tooth tissue. So it can't be just you pick up with a free hand and start reducing the occlusal surface. It is better to have some of these tools which is available now to use for preparation of the morphology driven preparation. And always the width of the finish line, unlike the earlier metal restorations will be less, the width will be less. And always the margin design, you have to optimize so that optimize the cutting of enamel prism so that there is good adhesion bonding. And also you should see whether the restoration has a optimum aesthetic integration of the two and any tooth colored material to the inclined plane design, which is recommended. Coming to some of the margin designs in indirect restorations, the butt joint is given when cuspal reduction to protect the tooth from the occlusal load is required. And when there is presence of lot of abrasion, erosion on the occlusal surface, and there is some degree of vertical dimension correction, it is always better to have a butt joint. An inclined plane or an inclined bevel can be given, given of 45 degrees or more, and the average length should be about 1 to 1.5 millimeter. Usually this sort of inclined plane design is given on the buccal side. However, it can be given on the palatal side of an upper molar or premolar when there's a crack in the palatal aspect. But for a lower molar lingual surface, because the dentin contour is almost straight, a shoulder would be preferred. Then coming to the inclined bevel, uh, actually helps in the aesthetic need of a gradual integration of restoration to transition. It provides a wider surface of external enamel for a good adhesive bonding. And it also creates more space for the restoration in the peripheral zone. Coming to the another type of margin design, the shoulder preparation, it is usually given when there is a central buildup and the shoulder should be at least one millimeter in width, having enamel margin if possible for better addition cementation procedures. This is given when cuspal fracture up to the cervical third is present yeah. and uh, central buildup automatically defines the peripheral shoulder design. And when a greater structural protection is required, for cusp coverage with cervical grasp. Coming to all the proximal preparation designs, there are three types of approaches depending upon the aesthetic protocol, the slot design, the bevel, and the ridge up. Slot design is when you remove all the caries. Okay, if it is minimal caries, you may find a situation like this where you have optimum one mm shoulder width, but generally a slot design is given for a when there is caries present in the proximal area. Bevel is given, it's a more, uh, it's a less invasive preparation for restoring the interproximal area. And it is indicated there is where there is not much of lesion and whatever the damage that is there or the discrepancy that is there is above the contact area. So a bevel type of preparation can be given for proximal surface where you have the finish line ending above the contact area. And then you have the ridge preservation and the ridge coverage type of situation where in the ridge preservation, the ma marginal ridge is not touched. It's only the buckle and the lingual wall is prepared for receiving cusp cover. And in the variant known as the ridge coverage, minimal reduction of marginal ridge is done so that uh, for the overlay type of restoration. All this cusp coverage when, uh, is for the purpose of structural protection, but where there is a good integrity of the ridge and absence of cavitated caries lesion. When there is caries lesion, 
other than the slot preparation, sometimes you have an optimal slot. Otherwise, you have the regular caries preparation. Regular uh, preparation, proximal box. I'll be covering in the next slide how the proximal box should look is the answer. Coming to the morphology-driven preparation, always the uh, KO surface angle on the buccal and palatal should be greater or equal to 90 degree with a hollow chamfer type of preparation. This makes the uh, KO surface perpendicular to the long axis of the enamel prisms and optimizes bonding. The occlusal surface for onlay or overlay should be anatomically prepared and there sh it should be free of slots, angles, shoulder finish line, etc. And when there is caries on the proximal slide, uh, proximal surface, a slip road type of curved without corners should be there. So it is like the box which has a ramp. So it's like a road which is curved. That's how the proximal surface should look. Then moving on to the same morphology driven preparation for inlay, the interior walls should divert six to 10 degree and have rounded internal angles. And for an overlay, which is above the uh, uh, equatorial line, a hollow chamfer type of preparation with the tip of cylindrical chamfer to maximize the preservation of tissue and enamel perpendicular to the longitudinal axis, which helps in bonding. Now, coming to the tooth preparation protocol. That means how do you prepare the tooth with all these basics in your mind? First, check the interclusures in centric and during lateral movement. Sometimes when the interclusures probably a metal restoration would be more the tooth. Establish the profile of the periodontal support should be made and the margin should not exceed 0 0.5 millimeter from the depth of the ginger. Sulcus. Then you start removing to plan your indirect restriction. Sometimes for interproximal zone, instead of using the regular burrs, you can have sonic type of system where there is oscillating selective type of diamond coated instruments, which will have only one sided diamond particles and the proximal surface. Uh, preserved sub gingival, a conservative deep margin elevation can be done. However, when the cavity margins exceed the or violate the biologic width, crown lengthening will be required. Any fissures in dentin or enamel should ideally be included in the preparation. And coming to access cavity walls, the thickness should be measured. If it is borderline, say between 2.5 to 3, you all know the mantra is 3 mm for root canal treated tooth, you consider the tooth position, presence or absence of any parafunction, type of guidance, whether it is canine gouded or group occlusion, presence or absence of marginal ridge, and proximal restoration margin, if it is where it is located, and taking all these into consideration, you can think or not of cusp cover. Coming to subgingival cavities that exceed the CEJ, conventional approach would be orthodontic extrusion or surgical exposure of the cervical margin. However, it has its own disadvantages. For example, hypersensitivity, unfavorable crown to root ratio, and delay in delivery of the final restriction. When bone also has been removed and when crown lengthening has been performed, it takes much longer time to deliver the final restriction as compared to when in case the margin is only intracravicular, then probably a deep margin elevation can be done for an intracravicular subgingival margin. I'm going to tell the 12 points, very important points of deep margin elevation because it's a very important procedure. First of all, it requires measurement of probing depth, bone sounding, 
the working field should be completely isolated with the rubber dam. Matrix should seal, ensure a good seal. Circumferential stainless steel matrix is preferred. Sometimes curved matrix provide better gingival emergence profile, uh, which with 3D anatomy is inserted. And then presence of sufficient tooth substance should be there both on the buccal and the lingual walls. Only then the circumferential matrix will have a good seal. In case it is not there, Garrison's loop matrix can be used. A thick layer of dentin potting agent is applied on the exposed dentin and light polymerized, catching up with the step of immediate dentin sealing. Then the deep margin is elevated using flowable or condensable composite. In case it's a microhybrid or a nanohybrid composite, preheating facilitates the placement. The amount of composite, so how much will you give for deep margin elevation? It should be about one to 1.5 millimeter because we have to avoid polymerization shrinkage. We want a good adaptation of the material so that we don't have marginal leakage. So it should be one to 1.5 millimeter. And once that is built up, maybe this matrix band can be removed and a more suitable matrix can be placed and then probably elevated it to a higher level. So, and any undercuts are present, geometry that needs to be corrected, cavity design optimization can be done by using flowable composite. So not only in deep margin elevation, we had little of immediate dentin sealing. We also have cavity design optimization in this step if required. Then the final polymerization should be always done through a glycerin gel to eliminate oxygen inhibition layer. And a post-operative bite wing radiograph, do not forget that to see the emergence profile and the correctness of your margin elevation. See, this is a series of pictures. You see a tooth which has been isolated with rubber dam and then the circumferential matrix and then the deep margin elevation. Coming to shade selection, for ceramic restoration, classical beta shade guide is most widely used. And for layered composite restoration, many of the indirect composite manufacturers have specific dentin enamel color selection. For example, Edelweiss D, Miris 2, et cetera. And what are the characteristics you would like to communicate with the lab? On the buccal or occlusal surface, you can plan a white spot or stains on fissures, which you can see from the uh, tooth on the opposite side, and you can send it with a simple schematic diagram. And for buccal cusp coverage, enamel shade could be preferred for minimally invasive occlusal coverage and dentin shade if it is extending all the way up to the cervical part of the restoration. And once the cavity preparation is done, there is a strategy known as immediate dentin sealing where the freshly cut dentin is protected and polymerized before making any impression. So let us go again, let us go through these steps very diligently. Preliminarily, you have to edge for two to three seconds. Why? Because we need to know where the dentin is. Then what happens after thorough rinsing, enamel has a frosty appearance and the dentin appears more glossy. You know where the dentin is. Then using a diamond burr, for HM rinse system or a tungsten carbide burr, if you are using a self edge system, a fresh layer of dentin is exposed, a thick layer of dentin bonding agent is applied and light polymerized according to manufacturer's instructions. In case of unfilled adhesives, a supplementary layer of flowable resin is added. Again, you can optimize the cavity and then the dentin bonding agent should be additionally polymerized through a glycerin gel to reduce the oxygen inhibition layer. And then excessive adhesive on the enamel margins need to be corrected with a diamond burr. And before the impression procedure with elastomeric materials, the tooth, need, tooth preparation needs to be pumiced softly with a rubber cuff for oxygen inhibition layer reduction. If not, there is tendency for some of these rubber-based impression material to have some sort of uh, chemical reaction with the 
dentin bonding agent and if poly it especially sticks on to the layer and it's very difficult to remove that so it is very important to do that step you miss uh, rubber cup step then after impression a separating medium like petroleum jelly is applied and then a temporary or a interim provisional restoration is placed and before placement of final restoration the sea surface is air abraded the enamel is etched with phosphoric acid the restoration is bonded with res resin based cement and again on the cavity on the restoration margins at, ar along the periphery glycerin gel is applied and light cured for 10 seconds the enamel margins with fine diamond instrument should be finished without exposing dentin so after immediate dentin sealing some of these steps have to be checked absence of undercut accessibility of subgingival margin and there should be absence of contact between the cavity and the adjacent tooth coming to protect protocol for fabrication of provision restoration isolation of tooth preparation should be done the cavity is applied with a layer forming glycerin and a soft provisional material or a semi rigid type of provisional material is applied without bonding and then light cured and the excess removed or a reverse spot bond can be done so that in the middle of the preparation small 2 to 3 mm of condensation silicone can be placed separating medium applied the condensation silicone is removed and then a uh, small active bonding area will then bond to the provisional restoration. Coming to the cementing and bonding protocol of various materials, zirconia. The bonding of zirconia to tooth structure, as you are all aware, is difficult. Why? Because of lack of glassy phase for acid etching and also lack of silica for resin bonding. In preparations with adequate retention form, zirconia restorations can be cemented using traditional cement following the protocol used for metal crown. And in preparation with less than optimum retention form, use of resin cement may improve the bonding. Here, sand blasting with alumina or silica coated alumina with less than 50 micron particle size and air pressure of 15 to 36 psi is done followed by use of a primer or a resin cement containing 10 mdp can be used for bonding zirconia to the tooth in case of lithium disilicate etching with 5 percent hydrofluoric acid for 20 seconds followed by application of silent primer and in case of resin ceramic composite that means ceramic infiltrated with resin sand blasting with alumina of 50 micron at an air pressure of 15 to 36 PSI followed by silent primer. So what happens? The sand blasting roughens the surface and the silent primer improves the chemical bond with the resin cement. Also, 5% hydrofluoric acid for 60 seconds can be used. For resin composite, similarly a soft sand blasting with 50 micron aluminum oxide with the intraoral sand blasting device at 15 to 36 PSI and or acid etching with phosphoric acid for 20 seconds or tribochemical coating with a silicon modified surface because of particle abrasion with silicon dioxide coated aluminum particles and also the surface becomes chemically reactive to the silent coupling agent or RBM EAG laser can be used. Additionally, for resin composite, Optimum cementation is dependent on the light source power, the irradiation time, and whether a light dual cure or a light cure composite is chosen. When preheating is chosen, 60 degrees centigrade, the material reaches optimum flow. Generally, total edge dentin adhesives are preferred, and removing residual cement before complete polymerization is recommended to avoid compromising restoration marginal accuracy compared to the use of burrs, discs, or strips. Coming on to the last leg of my presentation on metal restorations. As you all know, cast restorations, the main advantage is they replace and support the remaining tooth, tissue, tooth structure. 
They are also an excellent adjunct when periodontal therapy has been done and which is in a sort of resting phase. And then any uh, correction of contour, marginal ridge, embrasure, etc., can be given and it stays for a long time. Also, a gold base alloys can be given for partially subgingival restorations. And when the proximal caries is extensive, metal restorations are ideal. As you all know, principles, the preparation path should have a single insertion point. The epico occlusal taper per wall is two to five degree. And there is a definite need for retention in the form of dovetail, uh, grooves, etc. Generally, the difference between ceramic and cast gold inlays are ceramic inlay requires a little more thickness for the material as compared to a cast gold inlay. The divergence is also a little more as compared to a cast gold inlay. And the pulpal floor can be a V-shaped uh, or a rounded V, whereas it has to be a flat and perpendicular and uh, so that uh, uh, to the long axis of the tooth for a cast gold inlay. The internal line angles should be rounded for ceramic inlay, whereas it can be defined for cast gold inlay. And the axial wall needs to be convergent towards the occlusal surface for about 10 degree for ceramic inlay, again to accommodate the bulk of the material, whereas it can be perpendicular for cast gold inlay. The butt joint is required for a ceramic inlay, whereas a cast gold inlay requires a 140 to 150 degree angle so that you have 30 to 40 degree of marginal metal and occlusal bevel and gingival bevels are necessary for cast gold inlay and the marginal adaptation is frictional retention and axioproximal grooves in case secondary retention are required is given for cast gold inlay whereas the marginal adaptation for ceramic inlay is bonding or adhesion. Some of the armamentarium required for uh, metal inlay is the 271, 169L, and number 8862 burst, and the gingival marginal trimmers. <coughs> the wax pattern can be fabricated using the direct or the indirect method. In case of direct method, it's fast, easy technique when it's a simple, small inlay and functional morphology can be easily obtained. It, there is less laboratory work. And however, the disadvantages, disturbances at the gingival margins are difficult to detect and carve. It is difficult in a complex cavity, so it has to be a simple cavity. And stereoscopic judgment, that means the lingual surface is not seen in a direct method. And of course, the valuable chair side time is lost. Well, what are the advantages of indirect method? It's fabricated on a die. Direct vision is possible when you do the wax carving. You can check the gingival cable surface. You can check the lingual surface. And it is made even for a uh, distal occlusal tooth. Distal occlusal tooth. And also, uh, when multiple uh, inlays are required, the models need to be articulated. All these situations, an indirect method can be done. And direct method without matrix band is known as Volant's technique. The preparation of wax, wax pattern is as follows. Isolate the tooth, apply the separating media, apply the wedge, soften the wax, knead and shape it into the form of a cone, insert into the proximal box and apply firm finger pressure. And in case of wax pattern, direct method with matrix band, isolate, adapt the contour matrix band, adapt the wedge, add the separating media. However, remove the retainer, fill with softened wax, seat with firm pressure, carve the wax pattern, remove the matrix band with the pattern, release the pattern, place it back in the cavity and complete the carving. The sprue former should be attached to the wax pattern. Sprue is a channel through which the molten alloy can reach the mold in an invested ring. It can be of hollow metal, wax, hollow plastic, or metal or plastic coated with wax. And then in case of cast gold, it is flared towards the pattern. And in case of base metal alloys, it's constricted towards the pattern. 
and the choice of a sprue depends on the size of the pattern. The diameter can range from 10 to 16 gauge and reservoir is needed if it is a small die sprue and it is attached at the greatest bulk, 45 degree to a flat area. It is attached with sticky wax. In case of an MOD pattern, a staple pin and sprue can be used. These are all attached to the crucible former in best and it is cast. The casting is placed on the tooth using light pressure. Once it is ready after pickling and other uh, suitable uh, removal of screw and other conditions, then the occlusion is checked and any high points is reduced. The contact and the embrasure space should always be checked. It should be optimum. Then the grooves, the occlusal grooves can be refined using a dull round bar at slow speed. A knife edge rubber polishing wheel can be used to smoothen all the surfaces. Burnish the casting on the die and also on the tooth by applying well controlled pressure and it should run parallel to the gold margin and finally moving close to the margin. And then the final polish is done using Tripoli or rouge with a felt wheel. And prior to cementation, the tooth should be isolated. The traditional looting cement such as zinc phosphate, polycarbox slate, and conventional glass enoma can be used. In case resin modified glass enoma or resin cements have to be used, then uh, the internal surface of the casting, metal casting has to be prepared either by air abrasion or it can be tin plated or both can be done. Tin plating with a micro tin system for three seconds increases the retention of the casting to the tooth. And setting time for all these cements vary. So time to remove the excess cement, please follow the manufacturer's instructions carefully. And post cementation, occlusion should be re-evaluated. The high points should be adjusted with the egg or football shaped carbide burr. And then abrasive polishers should be used on the adjusted area. So this ends my presentation on indirect restoration. I hope this basic 101 class helps you to think and come to some decision-making process with respect to what type of indirect restoration you would like to place in the clinical situation. So what the mind does not know, the eye does not see. I hope my presentation has been an eye-opener to all the uh, uh, situations and also how to go about because the restorative success is in your hand. It's your judgment as a clinician which will bring about restorative success. These are my references and this is a dynamic thank you where you see a moving sort of thank you. I hope our mind is also always in a dynamic state so that we can imbibe more knowledge, learn more techniques, and take our profession to a much higher level. Thank you one and all for your patient hearing. I would also like to thank my ex-colleagues from BS Dental College. I'm at this stage because of all of them. And I would also like to mention special thanks to Dr. Deepak Mehta, Dr. Sobhanu Sindagi for their support, and also for Dr. Shrutika Mahajan for critically looking into my presentation and giving me a lot of suggestions. Thank you one and all. I would again like to thank Dr. Mahalakshmi, Dr. Rajkumar and the team SRM for having given me this opportunity to present this topic on basics or a 101 on post indirect restrictions today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meena, for a very wonderful presentation. Uh, absolutely, you had a whole point. And I would just like to sum it up uh, by your name only. M stands for meticulously prepared. E is for effectively expressed. Elegant slides, neat and awesome presentation. Thank you so much. It was wonderful and it was a complete revision for all of us clinicians sitting on the uh, uh, this side of the screen today. So thank you. I'm sure the participants had a good time revising as well as understanding the concepts. 
you know there are certain things which we do but we do not understand the concepts behind that so all those things were very neatly and very nicely expressed and taught by you today thank you once again uh, thank you so much is there any questions uh, no i don't think so yeah okay uh, maybe we will have a few other thing during the panel discussion at the end of the five days okay uh, so thank you so much dr meena for that meticulous as uh, aptly put by pratima meticulously prepared and i don't know how much time you have taken to prepare this time <laughs> i was my head was spinning listening to so much of uh, the thing so meticulously done and this meticulousness is what we expect of the teachers when they evaluate the students preparations so that is what we want them to know when because when they see the clinical scenario it's so different than what we actually read in theory so dr meena has already actually put everything thank you so thank much you and much. so a special thanks to pratima for thank wonderfully you. moderating and giving such nice uh, conclusion to her uh, speech thank you so much thank, thank you, you so madam much. thank you team as srn once again for this opportunity and you have all done a wonderful job we have been doing online webinars and i know lot of hard work goes behind it and i'm telling you you have done it excellently uh, so my thank compliments from my college and the department as well thank you so much i would thank also like to thank you sharam the second day has gone on very successfully dr mahalakshmi and your team really thanks a lot for thinking of such a conceptualizing such a program and also executing it that's also far more important true and dr murli wants to say something i think yeah dr murli yeah it is uh, as i tell everybody it's conservative dentistry and then endodontics no Uh, endodontics you cannot do anything too much by yourself you will have to dance according to the anatomy of the tooth your creativity and innovation comes only from restorative dentistry you should see cases instead of the pre clinical work which i hate in pg they always doing whatsapp instagram and when we go there the aerota noise starts we know that oh, even as you said rightly the last slide you will have to see cases for you to learn and judge instantly that we have blessed with lot of patience and one more this meticulousness and perfection even if i may not have a 35 years of follow up of my uh, uh, any documentation i am following meena ma'am from she was a pg student where she used to send her indirect registration work to coimbatore where i was working dr n meena sampige road malleshwaram 51 sampige road or something so dr subramanyam who i used to work with used to say evlo nalla panirka par handwriting e evlo nalla irundhadha na avanga work e evlo nalla irukum so we used sir here at that time i used to hate you because he used to compare us with you ma'am still you are the same we were just uh, budding uh, practitioners at that time or uh, preparing yes, for pg yes polished and uh... she has become polished yeah. polished yes, polished yes, yes. no they used to send uh, because dr jagdish was there since from gdc there was no lab there still i remember our parcels by courier or crown preparation for inlays so so i have a follow up of i am very glad to say follow up of 35 years of meena madam if not any other case i know thank you ma'am thanks for this thank you so really much for your kind words murli i no 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 ma'am it's such memories no, no, no. of how meticulously you have helped that practitioner there no 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 ma'am we are on time of, no no actually i uh, all of urge in case if you go to coimbatore you go see his center now his son has excelled in doing that it's called rs dental lab he is a orthodontist but he does including orthodontics everything yes a beautiful lab setup especially for indirect restoration and his father is now 75 years old still is active working i mean we are blessed to have such people and blessed to know you all from that time ma'am it was really good and just one point to add finally uh, regarding the you only thing is i think i should add uh, one clinical step which you cannot do in your all ceramic restoration this try in please never try to do try in of an cast restoration i mean like class restoration because that gains trying to only after bonding since you have a nice methods of capturing impressions make sure that you are perfect when you are sending it to your lab 
and no trying should be done i mean i think it's my thing experience your personal experience i don't know because invariably you would have done some mistake during uh, preparation and that unfortunately breaks our patients they don't do try in they actually try to start chew that is the whole problem even in trying stage with that thank you ma'am thank you for the extra thank you so much and, uh, so thank you so much murli uh, so much of efforts in preparing slides thank you ma'am thanks a lot i learned a lot from you thanks a lot murli priya yeah, ma'am thanks ma'am alash ma'am thank you thank you thank you once again uh, dr meena and dr pratima yeah, thank we you. wind up today's sessions today and we look forward to your presence all of your presence for tomorrow's session as well thank you have a great day yeah, bye thank you, you. and all bye